For most intents and purposes, Penn State's 2023 college football season ended on 11-11-23 with a 24-15 loss to the Michigan Wolverines, who went 13-0, won the Big Ten, and right now are the number one overall team in the country per college football playoff rankings, FPI, and the AP and Coaches Bowl. Penn State's other loss of the season was to the Ohio State Buckeyes, who are ranked number seven in the major polls and number two in FPI. Penn State is actually ranked third in FPI, and after a loss to Michigan, games against Rutgers, Michigan State, and likely the Peach Bowl are testing grounds for the future of the program and opportunities for players with NFL aspirations to improve their draft stock before the 2024 NFL Draft. Penn State is a program that should be chasing championships year in, year out. And they haven't won the Big Ten since 2016, and they have not and will never have played for a national championship in the four-team college football playoff era. With the 12-team playoff coming around, Penn State should expect to make the 12-team playoff almost every year, if not every year. And so far, Penn State's 2024 journey has, I think, been successful with the hiring of Andy Kotelnicki as offensive coordinator and Tom Allen as defensive coordinator. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And today's video has an interesting twist to it. So I encourage you to watch all the way through and also comment your thoughts down below on different points and opinions that I have throughout this video. Please like this video and share it around with other Penn State and college football fans and subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more college football content, whether it's centered around Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, the Big Ten in general. We're going to have a way too early preseason 2024 Big Ten predictions video that drops in January. Same with some other way too early predictions. And if you're interested in non-Big Ten football content, well, this channel does produce some non-Big Ten football content. But this is mainly a Big Ten football channel, and it is the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. Lastly, if you want to support the channel, you can make a donation in the comments section via, I think, a super chat feature. But more preferably, you can check out my Patreon page where... You'll get shouted out at the end of every video, and depending on your tier, you'll gain access to bonus content. Without further ado, let's get back into today's topic, though, which is really mixing in the hirings that have been made with the Peach Bowl and also a way, way, way too early look at Penn State's 2024 football season. Really, the only teams right now who haven't already started looking ahead to 2024 in one way or another are the four teams in the playoff. Michigan, Alabama, Washington, Texas. Teams that typically are not in the college football playoff conversation who are in a New Year's Six Bowl. Missouri, for example, you can bet they are not overlooking their Cotton Bowl appearance against Ohio State. Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl against Oregon. And I'd probably say Ole Miss, too. And most teams playing in a New Year's Six Bowl aren't going to be looking ahead anyway. But Penn State and Ohio State, for example, along with Georgia and really Florida State, as they expected to make the playoff at 13-0, these are programs that expect to be in New Year's Six Bowls any given year. That's their goal. They want to compete for national championships, or at least conference championships, year in and year out. And Ohio State and Georgia and Florida State, in my mind, competed for conference championships. In order to compete for a conference championship, you have to be in the race in the final few weeks of November and, you know, be in the top two, top three. So maybe Penn State was too, but after that loss to Ohio State, most wisely looked at the Nittany Lions and didn't necessarily write them off, but thought that it would be a tall task to beat Michigan given how dominant Michigan was, and it was a tall task. The Nittany Lions lost, and their offense this season 
Scoring offense, they were 12th nationally. Depending on how they do in the Peach Bowl, it could be top 10. They score 37.2 points per game, and they only allow 11.4 points per game. Penn State this season, by power rankings, is much better than they were last season, and that makes sense from an analytic point of view. Penn State last season scored 35.8 points per game, and they allowed 18.2 points per game. 20th scoring offense, 10th scoring defense this season. Their 12th scoring offense, 3rd in scoring defense. And their strength of schedule, 33rd in 2022, 34th in 2023, and it could be higher than that. Penn State, from a net result, improved compared to last year. It just didn't always feel like that in the beginning and middle of the season, but with how they beat Rutgers, how they beat Michigan State, in the same dominant fashion that Ohio State and Michigan did. It just took them longer to get going because of their offense. This Penn State team objectively made improvements. Slight improvements, not a major improvement, but improvements nonetheless from last year's team. And that's what makes this season disappointing in a certain sense, because Penn State played within single digits of Michigan and Ohio State, but you watch those games and by halftime, you knew who the better team was. Michigan controlled that entire game from second quarter onward. Ohio State controlled that game from about middle of the second quarter onward. Uh, Penn State was never in a position to take control of the game and uh, take control of their own destiny with one play or with one drive. They were in a position to make it a close game, to bring it back to 50-50, in terms of win probability with a drive, but never actually to take control and snatch a victory from a top 10 Ohio State or a top 10 Michigan, which Penn State has not beaten a top 10 Michigan ever under James Franklin, and they haven't beaten a top 10 Ohio State since 2016 when they beat, at the time, number two ranked Ohio State off of a blocked field goal. The reason I mentioned some teams looking ahead to 2024 is because Penn State was predicted by some to win the Big Ten this season, and they didn't. And Drew Aller was, look, it was something that I was somewhat right on in the preseason. I didn't think he was going to be this amazing quarterback. I thought he would be good, great, and even I overestimated him a little bit. He did worse than I expected from a preseason standpoint, and I was lower on him than most were. Penn State making these hirings, and they're already diving into the transfer portal. And I know they're going to try and convince some players to come back for next season. And they're returning Aller. They're returning Singleton, Allen. I don't know if Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren are guaranteed to be gone, but most of the offensive line is. And there will be some wide receivers who depart as well along with Adisa Isaac, Devon Ellis, uh, Keelan King is very likely gone. Johnny Dixon, Daquan Hardy, I think, are gone, though maybe they want to return or they have another year of eligibility. Um, with all the COVID stuff still mixed in, the COVID year, extra year of eligibility, and also name, image, and likeness deals that encourage players to return and not just bolt to the NFL the minute they're projected high enough, um, it, it makes things more complex. I can't just project that everyone who can leave Penn State will leave Penn State. Everyone could come back. Everyone could leave. The truth is likely somewhere in the middle, if not more toward more people leaving, because I don't think Penn State has a great NIL program, but maybe I'm wrong there. This season was mediocre. It was the same as last year. There were improvements on the field and from a power ranking standpoint, but overall, 10-2, and losses to Michigan, losses to Ohio State. They weren't blowout losses by scoreboard. They were closer, but oh so close, and yet oh so far, as Michigan won in Happy Valley without their head coach, running the football basically every play in the second half, and Ohio State with a worse O-line and with a worse quarterback than Ryan Day has had in any other year, Ohio State still is able to pull away and win 20-12 to by 8 points. So I do think in part, Penn State, they don't, I don't think they view this 
Peach Bowl game against Ole Miss as a Super Bowl in the same way that Missouri probably views their Cotton Bowl against Ohio State, where it's a chance to take down a top 10 team and Missouri isn't in this position. Probably similar for Ole Miss, not used to going to New Year's Six Bowls all the time as a fan base or program. Penn State, on the other hand, this is something that James Franklin is good at. He is good at winning New Year's Six Bowl games, and Penn State typically goes to a New Year's Six Bowl under Franklin. They went to the Rose Bowl last season and beat Utah. They went to the Cotton Bowl in 2019 and beat Memphis. They played in the Citrus Bowl, which isn't a New Year's Six Bowl, but that's like the bowl that's just below New Year's Six Bowl caliber. They played Kentucky in the Citrus Bowl in 2018. They played Washington and beat them in the Fiesta Bowl in 2017. And they played in the Rose Bowl in 2016 against USC, losing that game in a high-scoring shootout, 52-49, on a last-second field goal. If Penn State wins this Peach Bowl game, I think they're the first program in the college football playoff era, or James Franklin is going to be the first head coach, I don't think all time, maybe all time, but at least in the college football playoff era to win every single New Year's Six Bowl game. He's won the Cotton Bowl. He's won the Rose Bowl. He's won the Fiesta Bowl. He only got the Peach Bowl down. And while this isn't a Peach Bowl preview and prediction video, and I want to talk about the coordinator hires and really get into previewing some of my early thoughts for Penn State's 2024 football season, I will bounce back and forth talking about the Peach Bowl here because it's important. I said that Penn State's looking partially to 2024, but that doesn't mean they're overlooking Ole Miss. You can be planning for the long term and also be hyper-focused on the short term. It's what the great teams do. It's what the good head coaches do, the great and elite head coaches as well. I think James Franklin's a good to great head coach. I don't think he's near elite. I don't think he's elite. I will say it here. I think he's overrated, but not by this gargantuan amount. Only reason I say that James Franklin is overrated is because at some point, given a top 15 talent roster, you have to do something. You can't just sit there with a top 15 talent roster and only be a top 15, top fringe, top 10 program. You can't do that because that is making the assumption that every program is going to perform at their recruiting level, which is asinine. It's like making the assumption that every human is rational. You do it for simplicity's sake, but it's not going to happen. There will be the Texas A&Ms. There will be the Miamis. There will be the pre-2023 Texases, the, the Nebraskas, the programs that, or the USC even now, that suck in elite talent and just spray diarrhea everywhere. In the same way that there are programs that take talent and spit out garbage, there are programs that can take in lesser talent or talent period and, you know, like Georgia, win national championships, send like a, a couple handfuls of players to the NFL. Penn State sends players to the NFL every season, especially on defense. Penn State, for the first time in a while, has had an NFL-caliber singular offensive lineman, and they're improving there. At some point, to be considered great or to jump into that elite level, you have to make critical decisions with assistance. You have to improve and be good at game management. You have to be a good recruiter. Most importantly out of all of this is developing your players and building a good culture, which I think Franklin has. His players love him. And then you have to develop players not just to be future NFL prospects, but to be great college players, great teammates, high-energy guys, giving their all, maximizing their talent and work ethic. What, what they give to you, you double and give back to them, or you triple and give back to them, whatever you can do. And I guess that's my question with Franklin, is he can develop NFL players. Franklin can beat the teams who he should beat. He's pretty good at it, in fact. He can win New Year's Six Bowls. He can be in the college football playoff conversation, even the Big Ten conversation. But he cannot win 
regular season games that can help steer the fate of his teams on a yearly basis in a positive direction. He can't do it. Ryan Day owns him. Jim Harbaugh, right now, not, not all time, there, there have been moments where Franklin has outdueled Jim Harbaugh, but right now, 2021 to this year, the past three seasons, Jim Harbaugh has owned him. Top 10 teams are James Franklin's kryptonite. Most coaches don't have a winning record against top 10 or top 5 teams, but most coaches don't have the abysmal record that James Franklin has against top 10 competition. I made a video about that specifically regarding his performances against Michigan and Ohio State, which are blatantly different and in a bad way compared to his performances against every other Big Ten and regular season opponent, or I think every opponent outside of Michigan and outside of Ohio State. I'm going to link that video down in the description and also below a pinned comment so you all can check that out. It is awe-inspiring. But that doesn't mean Franklin's a bad head coach. He's a good head coach. And he he's made decisions that, in my mind, are indicative of someone who isn't set in his ways, exactly, of someone who still has the potential of chasing, maybe not championships plural, but a championship, given proper circumstances or championships. And I'll say this, Franklin's excellent at preparing in the postseason. It's why he has all his New Year's Six Bowl wins. That could come beneficial if and when Penn State makes the 12-team playoff. I'm That's something I'm curious about is Franklin's, from what we know, very good at preparing for the postseason, but he's never been able to get to the college football playoff. What happens when his teams no longer have to be perfect or near perfect in the regular season, but they still compete in the college football playoff? Do we see them perform at a higher level in the postseason like we have seen them perform in New Year's Six Bowl games? Who knows? But he's made elite coordinator hires, and these have been on the screen for a while, so I'll get to them. They're Andy Kotelnicki for offensive coordinator and Tom Allen for defensive coordinator. These are championship-level hires. Kotelnicki is a Broyles Award-caliber offensive coordinator. He's an elite OC. He, barring some... (laughs) Well, I don't know. It would be between him and Sharon Moore, and if Ohio State does what I think they should do to further their program, and they hire someone to take play-calling duties away from Ryan Day. Kotal Nicky and Sharon Moore for now, because the Ohio State opinion of mine is pure speculation, and I would lean towards saying that Day probably won't make that move, even though he should. Be between Kotal Nicky and Sharon Moore of who's the best offensive coordinator in the Big Ten. And I would say that Kotal Nicky's the better play-caller, Sharon Moore is probably the better CEO in terms of managing the locker room or the team, like we've seen him do this season in Jim Harbaugh's absence, and also in the case of developing his position, because I think Kotal Nicky will also be the quarterback's coach, I think. Kotal Nicky's offenses are creative, and they're centered around a consistent physical rushing attack. This pairs well with the Penn State offensive line that has depth, whether it's recruiting Alex Birchmeyer, Jevin Williams, um, Nick Dawkins, Dominic Ruley, uh, J.B. Nelson should be eligible to come back next season. He is eligible to come back next season, and he probably will. Um, Phil Trotween has recruited well at offensive line, and Penn State has gotten noticeably bigger and tougher, more Big Ten on the offensive line. Previously, Penn State's offensive lines, I think, have functioned a lot like Clemson's, where they're good, but they're not elite. And you need an elite offensive line to win national championships. You do. The only teams that have not had elite offensive lines and have won national championships have had generational play at the skill positions. 2018 Clemson, for example. 2016 Clemson, and there are probably some other teams as well, but like 2020 Alabama, both Georgia national championship teams, basically every Alabama team to have won a national championship, Ohio State in 2000, 
14, Florida State in 13, although they had some generational talent at the skill positions and also an amazing defense, those teams had elite offensive lines. And Penn State is going in the right direction there with recruiting. And I also think development, too, looking at players such as Olu Oluwatimi. Not a transfer, developed at Penn State, and he's probably going to be a first-round pick. Sal Warmly, Caden Wallace, these are players who might be drafted on day three, might be free agents, but still developed by Penn State. And Penn State had one of the biggest offensive lines in terms of weight and size this season, which can be meaningless, but can also be meaningful. I was very impressed with Penn State's ability to use the QB sneak, the short run game. It was really only stifled against programs like Ohio State and Michigan who have I think, top three, top four defenses this season. Kansas is 16-21 and 21 under Lance Leipold, with Kotal Nicky as the offensive coordinator, and Kansas scored over 30 points per game in 2022 and 2023. Jalen Daniels, Jason Bean, great quarterback play, and whether it is Highshaw or... Um, Devin Neal, almost forgot his name. I was thinking of Jalen Daniels, but Devin Neal, Highshaw, Mason Fairchild, their awesome tight end, and their offensive line was impressive this season as well. Same with their wide receiver core, I believe, with Lawrence Arnold, or it's maybe it's Lance Arnold, but I think it's Lawrence Arnold. They have impressive skill position talent, quarterback play, their physical at the line of attack, and these players were developed. Yes, some of them were transfers, Jason being transferred in from North Texas, but they've been at Kansas long enough to be developed. And it's impressive what Kotal Nicky did offensively. They're creative, they're physical, they're not afraid to test you in the passing game either, they're not afraid to be explosive, and I think that his physical ground game, paired with an offensive line that is losing starters and is going to be losing production, but I think has the potential to reload due to recruiting and also usage of the portal. Combining that with Nicholas Singleton, Katron Allen, Drew Aller, who should be better in all facets of the game next season. Hopefully some tight ends return in Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren. I know they have eligibility to return, but who knows if they do. And I think with some potential portal success at wide receiver, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, Penn State's offense could quickly become one of the nation's better and more physical offenses. It could become like Michigan's 2021 offense, or maybe 2022 offense, or minus the explosive wide receiver play, like a 2023 Ohio State offense with a better ground game, but a inferior wide receiver core. All of those would be top, those were top 10 offenses and offenses that were better in terms of efficiency than Penn State's this season. Tom Allen, another great hire. Fantastic replacement for Manny Diaz. Both were head coaches that failed in their respective positions, but great defensive minds. His defense has always outmatched his offenses at Indiana. They always played with toughness. The problem is without an offense and without great depth, The defenses would often be broken by halftime, and the team would just be battered and bruised by the half or really third or fourth quarter of the season at Indiana. Tom Allen, I think with the talent assembled at Penn State, will do a good job. Now, Chop Robinson, probably gone, because he'll get drafted in the first or second round, but likely first round. Adisa Isaac is gone. Uh, Johnny Dixon and Kalen King two corners, they're gone. Curtis Jacobs is probably gone, or potentially gone. But you return Zane Durant, you return Abdul Carter, you return Kobe King, Kevin Winston Jr., Jalen Reed, they're probably back. There are players like Tyler Elsden, Dominic DeLuca, Donnie Dennis Sutton, Zariah Fisher, Koziah Izzard, are great players, both in the second string, but also starters who will be coming back. And it's not a guarantee that any of these defensive players are leaving, because again, name, image, and likeness, you can now get paid in college, and part of the incentive to leave for the NFL as soon as possible is to get paid 
as soon as possible. Now you have injury insurance, you have direct name, image, and likeness deals, whether paid by boosters or just paid by local businesses. You have more opportunities in college than you've ever had before as an athlete, and that opens the door for James Franklin or Kotal Nicky or Tom Allen or um, Ty Howell or Josh on Sider or Terry Smith, cor- defensive back, cornerback, secondary coach, Anthony Poindexter, to all look at these players and say, hey, come back, let's run it back for another season. Or now you can get paid in college and I can continue to help you develop and you'll get paid while your NFL draft stock is rising. Instead of being like an unpaid internship in terms of development, college football can now be like a paid apprenticeship or something more. I heard that Marvin Harrison Jr. was getting offered in name, image, and likeness deals of of the equivalent salary of a first-round pick to come back for Ohio State and help them to win. So elite coordinator hires... And depending on how many starters return or how Penn State's development and recruiting is churning out, this sets up Penn State, in my mind, to have a successful 2024 season, especially given the schedule they have. Let's check out their schedule. It's one of the easier schedules that I have seen for a Big Ten team, in truth. Michigan's, for example, they host Texas out of conference. They host USC in conference, play at Washington in conference play at Illinois, host Oregon, play at Ohio State. It's a tough schedule. There could be like five ranked opponents, four or five ranked opponents that Michigan plays, and four of them could be in the top ten. It it could be a, a caliber of schedule, the one that Michigan State played this season. Ohio State, they don't play anyone in the non-conference, but they have to play at Oregon, they have to play at Penn State, and they have to host Michigan. Those are probably three top ten teams next season. Let's look at Penn State. They have to open up the season with West Virginia on August 31st. They host Bowling Green September 7th. They have a bye September 14th. They host Kent State September 21st. Host Illinois September 28th. Host UCLA October 5th. Play at USC October 12th. Probably a ranked team, but I don't think USC will be a top 10 team this season next season. I could be wrong, though. After that, by October 19th, at Wisconsin, October 26th, hosting Ohio State November 2nd, hosting Washington November 9th, playing at Purdue November 16th, playing at Minnesota November 23rd, and playing Maryland at home November 30th. I see maybe three at the best case scenario, but potentially two or at best in terms of you want your schedule to be as easy as possible, one top 10 team next year for Penn State. And that's at home against Ohio State. And Washington, I think, is a better chance of being top 10 next year than USC, even though they'll lose a lot. Right now they're using the portal better, and I think Washington is a decisively better staff, especially at strength and conditioning, and a better head coach than USC has. Both the Ohio State and Washington games are at home. Now, that October stretch, late October, early November stretch of USC by Wisconsin, Ohio State, Washington, that's a tough four-game stretch. Penn State's schedule is not easy, but it's easier than most Big Ten schedules in my mind. Depending on what happens at other schools and how good these hirings are, if James Franklin's willing to divest himself from the offense, which we know he has a hand in, and if the defense doesn't drop off much, we could be looking at an 11-1, 12-0 Penn State team. A Penn State team that competes in Indy for a Big Ten title. Or a Penn State team that maybe doesn't, but maybe they're 11-1, and, and you know it's Michigan-Ohio State undefeated in the game, and because of their tougher schedules, that means that they would get in even if they were tied with Penn State. They'd probably get in to Indy. But maybe that 11-1 and Penn State team gets, you know, the 5 or 6 seed. And they get a home game in December as a playoff game, which is just nuts. That stadium would be packed. It would be snowing. And whatever team is playing in Beaver Stadium in that cold weather 
especially if they're from the South, well, God help you. That will be that will be a tough ask. So there's a lot of opportunity with this 2024 season for Penn State. I said in the 2023 preseason, I said it. This is closer to a year ago rather than just three months ago I was even saying this, that Penn State season is 2024. That's the season. That's the ultimatum. That's the that's the inflection point. That's the fork in the road. That is really what could decide James Franklin's tenure at Penn State in a nutshell, is 2024. Because at that point, you have Aller in year two, you have two or three successful recruiting classes that have focused on the offensive line stacked on top of each other, which means you have good depth. And a five-star quarterback is a junior, hopefully with better development, and several games of starting experience can give you some momentum. Now, Aller didn't look as good as I thought. Then again, Mike Yersich, along with James Franklin's constant intervention, he should be, he shouldn't be in, he shouldn't be intervening in the offense. It's just his game time decisions are an atrocity. His game, his game management's hor- horrific, horrendous, whatever you want to use. Bringing in Kotal Nicky is huge. I don't think that Tom Allen was a downgrade to Manny Diaz. I don't think he could have done much better than Manny Diaz, honestly. Like, I think Jesse Minner, Phil Parker, and Jim Knowles are better coordinators. So I think there are three Big Ten teams that had better defensive coordinators than Penn State, but you weren't getting any of those. Phil Parker doesn't want to leave Iowa, and no one is going to go from Michigan or Ohio State to Penn State. And if they did, it would be a very rare, very rare and and almost unheard of move. Same with vice versa. Who's going from Penn State directly to Michigan or Ohio State, unless it's an obvious promotion, like you're a co-DC or a position coach going to become a coordinator. But anyway, I want to speculate about Penn State's future. A win over Ole Miss gives players confidence and momentum. And in order to have a shot at winning the Big Ten, momentum and confidence helps. And that could tie into starters coming back. You win the Peach Bowl against Ole Miss. Franklin gets more accolades. And the coordinators get to see what they're working with. They'll probably be on the sidelines in those games. Kotal Nicky and Tom Allen probably won't be coaching, or they if they do coaching, it won't be a gargantuan amount of it, but they'll be involved. Get to see what they have to work with, build those relationships and practices leading up to the Peach Bowl. You win, you beat Ole Miss, maybe you crush Ole Miss. Um, I don't want to give a way-too-early preview, because I will be doing a preview and prediction video for the Peach Bowl, but I think that Penn State's the more physical team. And I think that Penn State's better in more areas than just D-line, special teams, and overall defense. I think there are areas even offensively that Penn State's better in, specifically the offensive line and I'd say running back rotation. But perhaps I'm incorrect there. Running back rotation's a controversial opinion of mine because when you have Quinshawn Judkins, and I think it's Ulysses Bentley, is their second stringer, that right there is a great running back room as well. But anything helps. Momentum, confidence, returning starters is critical. Julian Fleming is crystal balled to Penn State. He would immediately be wide receiver number one for the Nittany Lions. That would be huge. It'd be humongous. Fleming had a good season in 2022. He had a meh, underwhelming season this year. But I was expecting Kyle McCord to not be as good as C.J. Stroud. And with Emeka Egbuka and Marvin Harrison Jr. coming back from last year along with Fleming, along with what I expected to be a stronger run game than what turned out to be, I didn't think that Fleming would even get the same production that he did in 2022. Fleming isn't an elite wide receiver, but he's great near elite five-star talent, so maybe he can have a late bloom and become an elite receiver? We'll have to see. 
I also think that the Lions need help at offensive line and defensive back. You're losing four starters, including a first-round offensive tackle in Olu Fashanu on the offensive line. And Hunter Norzad, I don't think he was as good of a center as Juice Scruggs, but you're going to be missing him. And Sal Wormley and Caden Wallace will be gone too in all likelihood. So both tackles and much of the interior offensive line from a starting perspective are gone. And Jevin Williams, um, Alex Birchmeyer, these are players that are likely going to be more involved in the rotation or potentially starting next season along with uh, Nick Dawkins, Ola Vega, Ione, and Drew Shelton. These are, you know, Penn State does have depth at the offensive line, but I think they need some portal help there. And at defensive back, Kalen King, elite player. Johnny Dixon, not at the same level, but still, great college corner. I think bringing in at least one cornerback or maybe two could be helpful. I expect Aller and the passing game especially to take steps forward in 2024. I do think the wide receiver room will improve, whether because of returning production or likely landing Fleming in the portal. I think Aller will improve with Kotelnicki's system in coaching. I think Kotelnicki's system can work with Aller because Jason Bean and Daniels, I think, were be- faster runners than Aller. But they weren't like Lamar Jackson or Jalen Milrow or Kyler Murray or Jalen Hurts. They, they weren't. They, they just weren't those. They aren't those players, but they're still athletic. And Kotelnicki does a very good job of getting everyone in the offense involved. I think Aller's going to take a step forward in 2024 along with the passing game. I think the ground game will probably be more explosive. I just think Penn State's offense in general will be better. And part of that is because the offense was so horrifically mismanaged, despite somewhat obvious talent, that I think with hiring a great offensive coordinator like Kotal Nicky, Franklin's offense can only go up from here. The defense, I think, will likely take a step back. Part of me thinks that on one hand, because of Donnie Dennis Sutton, Zariah Fisher, and also the fact that Penn State's defensive tackles in a way function like defensive ends with their pass rush. Part of me thinks the D-line and and linebacker core will overall be the same and it'll be the secondary that takes a step back. Then there's another part of me that thinks, well, the secondary is what Penn State is known for. It'll be the defensive line with Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, Devon Ellis, and likely Hakeem Biaman as well leaving that'll take a step back. I think the strength will be the linebacker core for Penn State because Kobe King, starter, he's probably coming back. And Abdul Carter, he's not even draft eligible yet. And that's an all-American caliber player at linebacker. And Tyler Elston, Dominic DeLuca, Keon Wiley, they return. Curtis Jacobs could return. I don't know if he will, but he does have eligibility. So if, if he wants to return, he can, and that would be one of the best, if not possibly the best, linebacker room nationally. Probably would be the best linebacker room in the Big Ten straight up, because Michigan will lose Michael Barrett, they could lose Junior Colson, and Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers are gone from Ohio State. With Iowa, I don't know if Nick Jackson and Jay Higgins are eligible to return or not, but we'll just have to see. I still think the defense will be elite. I think it'll be top 10, probably better than that. And just want to get a quick look at special teams here. Alex Falcons and Riley Thompson are senior transfers. I don't know if they have one more year of COVID eligibility left or not. So special teams could potentially be a gray area. To close off this video, Penn State is the 13th best 2024 recruiting class, and they, they'll, they'll return several star players. They'll return... Keytron Allen, who I think is the best running back on the team currently. Singleton will come back. Aller and Pribulo will return. That could legitimately be a quarterback battle. I'm not even kidding you. If Aller doesn't take steps forward, if it turns out that his phenomenal senior season in high school was somewhat of a fluke and Pribula somehow makes consistent gains, that could be a quarterback battle. But I'm going to assume for now Aller, just because he looks much more 
polished and better as a passer. I'm going to assume that he'll be starting next season. He comes back. Lambert Smith could make a return. Same with tight ends. Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson, they could also go in the NFL. And defensively, Abdul Carter comes back. Zane Durant comes back. And there are players like Donnie Dennis Sutton, who is a five-star, along with Nicholas Singleton and Drew Aller in that 2022 recruiting class who are going to come back as well. That's all I have to say in this video. I enjoyed talking about Penn State here and looking ahead to their 2024 season. Thank you so much to Crash2488 for being my Heisman patron of the month of December. Thanks to Spencer Bringers for being my All-American patron for the month of December. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being All-Conference patrons of the month of December. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all around. Bye-bye.